All right. So I am uh, Katie Yasin, and I will be talking a little bit about Alzheimer's disease disparity and specifically nursing facilities. So we've already been talking a lot about disparities and talking a lot about the health challenges challenges that we disparities cause. And we've been talking a lot about fancy methods that we can use of all sorts of things. But it's not necessary. I guess it usually reality works. I think not about it. <laughs> it's all right. So instead, I'm going to use this here microphone. So uh, usually we talk about fairly advanced methods here. But we don't have to use advanced methods if we got the right data. I mean, all you can do is you can look at some pictures and you can compare what does one data set show you versus what does another data set show you. And this allows you to get into problems of what is overpowered and what is underpowered. So a Dr. Karnan mentioned an 850 overpowered clinical site. I look at, say, 850, well, might as well put it in the trash, can't do anything with why can't I do anything with that? Well, let's look, look at that model. First, we have health is far apparent. And we have some sex-related disparities in geography and race and ethnicity and gender. And we have one word for each circle. However, that's a very misleading word, except for biological sex. We got, we got enough doctors here to get that one down, right? But uh, let's go to race and ethnicity, right? Well, uh, I'm black. What does that mean? Ask a guy in Africa versus a guy uh, from uh, the ghetto down in Raleigh, tell you different things. What does it mean? It means something different. What does it mean to be Hispanic? Well, which one? Do you speak Spanish? No, I speak Castilian. What's the difference? I didn't know until someone told me, but there is a difference, right? Castilian, I thought it had something to do with Castile and old Spain and Europe. No, that apparently has to do with mixing uh, Spanish with a uh, mind. Never guess. So these are words, right? Geography. Well, geography hides with an ethnicity. You see a lot of uh, genetic studies that say people of European heritage. Oh my, who are those? I must be one of those. But uh, which one? I'm not a Frank. Hopefully, I'm not related to any Germans. They drink beer. Do that, right? So I don't know. What am I? I guess I have to go get some genetics done, and then I'll figure out. I'm an Eskimo, but I don't look like. Right, so there's all sorts of problems with identifying these groups. And if you can't define a homogenous group or a homogenous enough group, what are you calculating disparities between? You don't know, you're averaging out whatever happens to be in the group and whatever racial, ethnic, behavioral, cultural, what have you differences happen to be in that group, they get averaged out too. So is 850 people a lot enough? Well, if they're uh, all from the same cultural background, had similar education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's a lot of people, right? If you uh, split them across the United States and across all the diversity that we have in the United States, and you add into that, that a lot of that diversity is unobservable. We've talked about propensity score methods and variations and variations and variations on more complex ways of doing the same thing, which is matching people according to observables but a lot of this stuff is not observable at all. So what do we do? One of the things that we can do is we can improve the data that we gather, but that's very, very expensive. The other thing that we can do is we can grab some of the data that the government is gathering for us already because it either has to pay someone money or wants to receive money. And we're in a capitalist society, money motivates everyone motivates me that's why i'm here today of well, that and uh, philosophy everyone loves philosophy it's in the work so what's so useful about the minimum data set the minimum data set contains the result of standardized so they're displayed regardless of whether it's given comprehensive instruments of assessment of nursing home patients nursing home patients can be of any age but uh, for our interest they're 65 and over, but there have been quite a few young people there as well. So it collects a huge amount of variables. It doesn't always collect them, but it collects 831 variables. It collects them quarterly, at least. 
And there's all sorts of other different rules, which aren't that important until you start actually getting into the analysis. But what's, the, what's important to us is that everyone does it. It started out as regulations from CMS for the Medicaid and Medicare program. So if you wanted to get paid by the CMS, you had to do these evaluations. But they turned out to be so useful over time that now everyone does, pretty much. Again, if you want the grandma to go to a nursing home and you don't do these, don't send her to that person. But everyone does these, they're very useful data. Now, since everyone does these, and again, this is just some information, I talked about this before, you're free to read over this at a, a later time. It's been so useful that it's been revised at least three times. Already. And each revision is, of course, a hiccup in the analysis. I'll sort of talk about that later. But the good thing about the MDS is that everyone does it, which means we have outstanding sample size. So Pacific Island, not the most populous group in the United States, as you will see, but we have based on 4,454 people who identify as Pacific Islanders. And all of the data that's available from DS and what's linkable to the MDS from other age or income appropriate sources, like, for example, Medicare, Medicaid, if you're uh, in real good terms with the Army, maybe they'll let you link something to it as well. Otherwise, not so much, right? But this is huge. The health and retirement study is uh, 50,000 or something overall and about 20 something thousand is Medicare enabled. Here we have more people just in this obscure category, Pacific Islanders. So we have, of course, 21 uh, million uh, white Americans, 1 million Hispanics, 85,000 Native Americans, 3 million African Americans, 500,000 Asians, what have you. And the Alzheimer's disease population is equally large right, in, in proportion. So you can see uh, the pie charts, they look more or less the same, right? So uh, I guess there must be no disparities whatsoever in our right? So even though we have a decent amount of people here and a decent amount in comparable percentages of each population have Alzheimer's disease, there are quite a few disparities inside of these nursing homes. So here we have all of the races and ethnicities that I could gather together from the MDS. Other race ethnicities, black, all the way in the bottom, we can see confidence intervals right here. This is a huge data. We have small confidence intervals. So this is perfectly normal. So uh, as previously mentioned, a lot of these are going to be statistically significant. And I guess they are statistically significant for the most part. So other race, ethnicity, the least homogenous group, who are these people? I don't know, neither does anyone else, right? Maybe they're Indian. Well, a lot of the people who are Indian and that filled out the demographic questionnaire for this seminar right here said that they're Asian. So maybe they're Indian, maybe they're not, right? We don't know who these other guys are. But they have low Alzheimer's disease rates once they actually get into the nursing home. Next up, we have Asians. Asians have lower rates than whites on average, except with the very high rates when it starts and going up. As we'll see a little bit later, Asians aren't really that big at putting their people into nursing homes. So we're going to have some uh, population maps, and we're going to see it doesn't happen that often. So blue, blue is uh, sort of your bog standard, 79% whites. So there it goes on. After that, we have African Americans followed by Hispanics. So this pattern of disparities is here, and it generally makes sense, at least as far as African Americans and Hispanics are concerned. This is what we expect to see. I've put in the Native Americans and the Pacific Islanders, just like as lines in here, because I ran out of colors and they overlap too much with everything else. It'll be very inconceivable. Uh, the sample is fairly small for both of those, so the confidence intervals are fairly large, but they're not so large that you can't say that they're not statistically different from Hispanic or African Americans. What value you choose to put into that depends on your clinical practice and statistical ability. So this is just 
a trend of the disparities compared to whites. So higher, more than whites, uh, lower than zero, less than whites. This shows pretty much the same picture. And then we can see that a lot of these disparities for most ethnicities, except for Asian, Asians have their own pattern, right? Goes up of age. Gender, uh, sex-related disparities, we're not allowed to use the word gender for this anymore, so I'm not going to. Again, they're still there, go up with age, uh, males uh, less than female. Now, we have that circle that says geography. Let's see how all of this sample size actually goes out into us being, to, being able to or unable to measure geographic disparities. Here's a cheat sheet. For those of us that have kids that went to college and no longer remember the states or from people that aren't from America. These are the United States. Let's see what's going on. So first, let's take a look at the geographic variation. So here on the right, we're always going to have the age adjusted rates. And on the left, we're going to have the group rates. And on the next slide, I'm going to add in singular maps from Medicare 5% data, which represents the whole Medicare population. So we're comparing nursing homes, where we expect to see higher rates, to the general population, where we expect to see more national level rates. And I'm including the age adjusted rate here just to make a point about data size and representability. Uh, some states to pay attention to up front. North Dakota is going to be a troublemaker. No one lives there, but there's all sorts of strange rates going up. West Virginia, mm -hmm. horrible place to be if you don't want Alzheimer's disease. That's another place to look at. Well, uh, the stroke belt in the southern states, but not visible here. We're also going to look at Colorado. Colorado is going to pop out on a regular basis. That's that guy right here. And surprise, surprise, this little guy right here in New Hampshire also is going to be causing trouble over time. But uh, so far, this is just a general uh, MDS map. Nothing exciting for males. And for females, again, we expect high rates for females, but uh, apparently, especially in North Dakota. Let's remember about North Dakota, a very low population state. Now, so whites, that's 75%. Let's go past whites. We want to talk about whites. There we go. So let's get to the main order. So this is a heat map of the proportion of people that identify as Black or African Americans, or anything having to do with Black skin color, as a percent of the nursing home population. So where do Black people in nursing home live? Well, uh, they live in the South, all the way up until here. There's a little bit more in uh, the Great Lakes states. They don't live over here, right? So let's try to remember this now. now I'm sorry, is that within African Americans or is that? No, that's uh, within nursing homes. So within the total nursing home population, all sexes, all races, all ethnicities, whatever you manage to put down on your evaluation, this is the proportion of African Americans. So 25% or greater here. I'm trying to use the exact same scale, heat scale for every single man. So it's every 2%. This hides some of the national variation in rates using 5% data, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, I'll say. So here's the 5% data prevalence map for Alzheimer's disease in African Americans. It looks blue other than New Hampshire. Something is going on in New Hampshire. We don't know what. But blue means just don't work, right? If we change the map scale a little bit, all the colors will start showing up. There's a lot of in-state variation. But when you compare it to the population where the Alzheimer's disease people actually are, right? not too many are going to be living in the community. Right? So when you're comparing it to the nursing home population, it's not that bad, except for Nancy. Don't go there. Right, so uh, African-Americans, again, uh, there's some problems in Colorado overall. In the, some of the southern states, Arkansas, Arkansas is a very poor, badly doing state, is going to show up quite often. 
And now uh, what's the other one? Is it big? Our Sandy, that's yeah. a, that's not a Colorado, that's Wyoming. No, I don't yeah. Yeah. You, you got it. It's much less populous state. Even less populous. So again, something that's why we have it. There you go. So this is one of the reasons we have these, because we want to see low population, high rate, probably concentrated in the nursing. Especially if there's a low population and it's low enough that she can calculate an age adjusted rate. Well, why can't she calculate an age adjusted rate? You're missing an age group. And I need these in a seven age group. So they're already aggregated. So is the Wyoming overpowered? No, not even with this huge data set, right? We can't calculate an age adjusted rate. And we start getting at normally high rates when we're looking at the crews in the nursing homes. And the uh, state level map doesn't look that bad. Well, it's a little bit higher, but it doesn't look that bad. So we just look at some pictures, and this is a good indication that there's something going on at a very local level. So for a low population state, there could be one nursing home that's theoretically, right? That's causing all of these problems. Just something to look out. And again, if you look at the population, uh, not that many African Americans live. Really. So males and females, again, pretty much stroke belt right here. We're seeing plenty about the stroke belt and the usual trouble. So next we have Hispanic Americans, and this is where Hispanic Americans live in nursing homes. They may live in the community at other rates, but this is where they live in nursing homes. Makes perfect sense. Uh, New York looks a little weird, but I don't know much about New York. So maybe there's plenty of people there as well. So uh, the rates, again, West Virginia looks bad as usual. doesn't look bad as far as the Hispanic residents, but not that many Hispanics there. But there are plenty of Hispanics with Alzheimer's disease in the nursing homes. Right? Why are they there? We don't know. But all the other states look reasonable. And again, on the overall Medicare maps, we have West Virginia standing up populationally for Hispanics. Uh, yeah, something going on with New Hampshire, but remember, these are small population share. Whatever's going on there, it's probably not something we want to write to JAMA about. We want to go see inside and see what's going on here. Is there one or two nursing homes? Is there like a national program that everyone takes their relatives there because there's the best outcome? So not everything is reason to panic. Again, Hispanic males uh, come to Texas and South Dakota for some reason. That's the way it comes out. And West Virginia, again, causing trouble. Next, we have Asian Americans. Asian Americans in nursing homes concentrate in uh, California and, of course, in Hawaii. If you've ever been to Hawaii, a lot of Japanese people there. And if you try to get a job, you'll know. Right, Kat? Reasonably enough, since there's a lot of Asian people there, there's also a lot of Asian people in nursing homes there. But look, we're getting rates all over the place. North Dakota, again, very high rates among Asians. Maybe there's two of them. Maybe there's a hundred. But they're there and they're causing these rates. That doesn't mean there's something bad going on until you take a look. Now, Again, other race, ethnicity, this is uh, the dumpster group. No one knows who these are, right? So it's okay to put other races in this group when you don't have enough power. That's at least what I do. It may takes one group of people you don't know who they are and you add another group of people into the same bucket. The interpretation doesn't change. We don't know who these people are, but we have some race for them. Now, Pacific Islanders, live in Hawaii most of the time, right? And that's where their nursing home records are. But there's plenty of them spread out throughout the country as well. So again, this is, right, we need to go and we need to do something about Pacific Islander health, health in South Dakota. And there's more in Louisiana, right? We need millions of dollars to go there, right? Look at that color. It's a bad color. But no one lives there. So it's a false result. I mean, it's there, it's true, you can go down and track which nursing home is actually doing it, but
but it's not a populational result. It's not something to go and fix. And we have Native Americans. Just out of curiosity, I put up a Native American reservation map. And as you can see, concentrations of Native Americans and nursing homes map into those large groups of Native American reservations, which makes perfect sense. But again, right, uh, all the usual suspects, there are high rates in the South. You know, what are we going to do? You know, the only question, the only answer is to be more careful with interpreting our data and be more careful with identifying our populations of interest. So is a study of 850 people overpowered? I don't know, right? It depends on the population we're trying to study. If we're trying to study the United States of America, it's not overpowered, it's, it's a weak study, right? If we already selected a very well-defined homogenous group, that's more power than you'll ever need. So it all depends on your main. When uh, doing analysis, be careful of using 50 minorities to represent a category which is not homogenous, is not themselves. You're gonna get weird results. And we see some of these from time. So this is my simple presentation about not having to do complex analysis to find useful things from there. Thank you. Um, questions? Yeah. Uh, by Dr. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm uh, saying, do you have uh, some instruments in uh, your MDS data to try to explain these variations you demonstrate. Sure, we have 829 variants. Take your pick. And, and you want the cognition data, we have cognition data. You want something else, we got something else. And this is uh, which kind of uh, it's, it's, environment related? Well, uh, since version three, they've been doing the brief interview for mental stats. And I won't comment on the quality of that versus the MMSC. Some people will not like it. And some people will write an article about it. It's essentially the same thing. Both will get published. Right? It's up to you. If you like it, use it. That's what you have. Don't have anything else. That goes there. Right? In MTS 2.0, there were all sorts of schemes to get indirect versions of cognition. I think cognitive health scale or something like that, that they used other questions to generate, like proxy interviews, sort of, but not proxy interviews. But the formal assessment comes with 3.0, and that's the BIMS. And we can do that. We can actually see uh, how does it vary by uh, mental status, or at the very least, how does it uh, vary by your ability to do tests? Because I'm bad at cognition tests. I, I can't remember uh, 20 words that you just told me. Maybe I'll remember two weeks from now, but definitely not right away, right? Some of the questions on the test, oh, they'll stump me. I'm not going to look very good. And then you'll give me a cognitive impairment diagnosis and uh, I'll go get very expensive treatment. And I have insurance, so everyone is going to be happy, except for CMS if I'm 65 and old, right? They're going to go bang. Other questions? A good question. Just to add to what you said about power, it said depends on the population of the group. So, also depends on the question that's being asked. If you overpowered for a specific game one and underpowered for a specific game two, it said that if you pick in the clinical trials, you can pick your metric, you can pick one that is more likely to show a difference and gets you your Eureka kind of paper, or you can pick a more stringent measure. So, it's, it's I hate to use the term game. This is not a game, it's a serious business, but many factors go into choosing. I mean, you know it's fine. Mm -hmm. 